Hello friends and welcome to another video. In this video I want to talk about these speakers. And the reason is I've had these now for a year. Since three months the development has really stopped. I'm very happy where they are now. Um, I might do another iteration on them. And, um, and what I want to do is just share some of my learnings and insights and whether you should do this project and um, share those things with you so hopefully for you uh, for those of you who are deciding on these have ever attempted to uh, do these um, you get some answers or maybe some uh, something that can help you uh, find your own direction in audio and um, in my experience the amp and speaker choice is very uh, crucial in that and um, so that's it and i will do this in two videos so there'll be two parts to it um, it also have a, has a title, so it's 12 more insights and uh, you hear the magpies outside and probably in the background. Um, but these are the topics, so 12 more insights and we'll talk about the perks of mono, so mid busting, um, some insights from the DIY part, some breakthrough in sound quality, uh, things that are discovered there and then some crossover design tips. And those uh, last two points will probably be in video too, just to break it up. So um, they'll be uh, like each 10, 15 minutes long, depending on how we go. Um, for those of you that haven't seen this video, uh, the Lancelot speakers, I've got posted and don't know what they are. Um, well, what they are is um, Janos from Real World Audio. He t basically came up with a design that um, uses um, high efficiency speakers and what he used was the drivers of the old Altec A5 and A7 um, speakers, which have a phenomenal sound quality. However, they were meant for theaters and not for the living room. So he made a design um, that addressed the bass. Um, it, it turned them into omnidirectional speakers and, and, and made them suitable for the living room situation and to be driven by uh, very low power tube amps and give a fantastic um, frequency spectrum and sound um, which is really remarkable very different from most speakers um, that that you probably have experienced um, now my take on that is a little bit different uh, you can see that in other videos with different considerations so at the moment you can actually see I've also went to a double situation where I now have two Altec 414s and um, an Electro Voice compression driver. Um, these are a bit more b budget than the full uh, Lancelot, but I, they have the same, uh, a lot of the same qualities. And what I've done over the last year is optimize the crossover. Um, but now, in, in its current state, it's actually a very simple crossover. I will also share the design later, probably in, in part two of this video. And um, yeah, after and, and this gives me such a good sound that I have very little impetus now to change it or upgrade it or so. So it is it's actually really landed. And funnily enough, a lot of speaker designers that I've heard, like uh, John DeVore and so on, they talk about they have this trajectory of eight, nine months to optimize the speaker. And really, it's the same thing that I um, have done. And it's not so much that you spend eight, nine months full time. It's just that you end up that you have that throughput to get to grips with it. And I was, of course, a novice to actually doing the crossover design and so on. And um, there, there, there's no recipe for this. So um, it was a part of discovery, but it was a very insightful part. And it has brought me way more than just the speaker. And um, that's what I sort of want to share in this video. So I'll, uh, I'll hope you get something useful out of it. And I hope that's interesting for you. And um, yeah, so let's get started with my points here. So first point, the perks of mono. Now, as you can see, I would have never thought it, but um, I actually went mono during this project. And um, what are the perks of that? Well, the major thing is that my listening habits that I realized, whereas 20 years ago I would have maybe quad ESL, um, or 30 years ago I would have quad ESL 57s, and I had a nice tube amp driving it and a very good CD player and so on. However, it had a really nice sweet spot and listening. And 
fantastic stereo. It's like almost headphone like, um, but, but 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 more loose and much more um, comfortable on the long run uh, with those. And it's and it's a real great experience. The effect of having a hull recreated and so on is is impressive. However. It is not my listening habit today and um, I, I just want music to fill the house and, and not to sound weird and with, what I found with a lot of stereo speakers is that you get these huge variations in frequency response all throughout the house. It, it, it rarely sounds good everywhere. Whereas with this, and I think it's because it's a corner setup and all the waves go out, they don't bounce back to the back wall and come back and then you have cancellations and um, patterns. For some reason, it has here it is much more controlled. And what I find is, and you could have seen this in earlier videos, where I, I walk around while playing a soundtrack, um, a music track, that the, the frequency response throughout the room is very even. And it, it also doesn't seem to diminish as much as a normal speaker setup uh, by um, um, going at a distance. If I'm in my office, it still sounds good. Um, this, this realism factor, if you turn your back to it and walk out of the uh, out of the door, sometimes, I, more often than not, I just get grabbed by the music and I'll, I'll just stand still and I'm like, ooh, that's nice. And that all has to do with that this position, um, this mono sound, prop, uh, and especially coming from a corner where it uses the rest of the, ho the house as almost like a horn. Um, and it also ha doesn't have any baffle step problems. So that experience of being able to freely walk around through the whole house and have really good sound quality um that is really what these speakers have done and, and the omnidirectional one um makes it just that it yeah it, it really feels fills the room with music in, in a way that i haven't seen normal speakers do whether they're panel speakers or box speakers um uh, they, they have this directional quality that um, seems to interfere uh, with, with that effect if, if you want the whole room to have the same music and music quality. Anyway, that's the perks of mono. Let's go to do a bit of mid busting now. So we'll go here, the next two points. And a corner setup is boomy. So as you can see, it's a corner setup. It is not boomy. And um, it's just one of those Whenever people have just this one truth and it's a sort of a universal generalizations like tubes are warm and slow or um, corner setups are boomy, um, just stamp it rubbish. It, it is a localized truth and you might have experienced it. And yes, you know what? When I was 14, I would walk in a, in, in a room and I would immediately hear that the speakers were in a corner setup and you this this weird bass and some muffled highs and so on. I would move the speakers around and people would go, oh, this sounds three times better. And they go, so, yeah. But anyway, if a speaker is designed to, to, to be in a corner, it will sound good. And, um, and, and we'll get to into design choices and the perks of DIY. Um, but really, when you're buying a speaker or you're, you're building a DIY model, you need to know what they were designed for and whether um, um, well for what how for what placement and um, if you don't know that you, you don't actually know what you're getting and so if a speaker is designed to be in a corner it will sound brilliant in a corner and not boomy it is not and actually the propagation that i just talked about earlier um, is a part of of getting a very high quality and defined bass ro rolling through your house um, and far from boomy I, I, I challenge you to find any of my music p clips where it sounds boomy, except maybe for the first one. Um, ah, yes, the omnidirectional thing. So Janus from Real World Audio, who did his, uh, who had his, long, who did the first Lancelots that he designed. So he got a lot of flack uh, apparently on his channel to say people saying, "Oh, your speakers are not truly omnidirectional because between 250 hertz and 500 hertz, they're not." entirely 360 now i think again it's a lot of hogwash that those are being slung at him while technically true you have to realize is it is it important for your listening and um and and maybe if, if you have followed me you've seen this 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 speaker had crossover points from 300 
to um, at 500 and at 900 and now at 2100 hertz and so this would have majorly influenced the, the, the directional pattern because as the frequency as I asked these woofers to do more high frequencies they would have gotten more directional now these are Altec 414s are exceptionally good in the directionality um, it is amazing for 12 inch um, I don't think you'll find much better than these however did I notice a shift between the 300 Hertz which will make these fully omnidirectional and at 2100 Hertz the difference is negligible. We are very sensitive to this region above 2 kHz. And this is still fully omnidirectional. And then, um, being a corner setup, what only matters is sort of this 70, 80 degrees coming out of the corner that needs to have that, that even directionality to get all the perks of an omni setup. Um, I don't think it matters that much that, that, um, that, that I improve, that I that you'd maybe only get 90 degrees or 70 degrees of directionality. Uh, it is, I'd say you get, if you have that, and it's very even for on 70 degrees, you're enjoying 95% of the benefits of an omnidirectional speaker, especially when you have a setup like mine. Um, but I would say in nearly all situations, it, it you would get the, the majority of an omnidirectional. So it's just not critical. Um, I don't think Janos deserve to get any flack on, the, on this because in, in practical terms it hardly matters. Um, that's my experience at least here. So, um, then the final part of this, this um, is some DIY insights. Um, so, as I said, like what I noticed, a lot of you, um, that I saw sort of commenting or, or deliberating when I, I had my first videos on this Lancelot design was, you know, should I be doing it? And, and then you had Janos uh, from Real World Audio uh, warning you that this is not a beginner's project. And now I had built a couple of speakers before, like um, literally, I think two or three, um, but they were all ready-made models. Uh, uh, you know, designs. I, uh, very early on when I was 16 or so, I built a CAF. And um, later, um, and we of course had a Carlson, and then um, I did a Viva. And what else did I do? Yeah, but those were ready-made designs, and I actually didn't learn too much from them. It was just a cheap way to getting a very good speaker, um, and, and and I was always well advised in in ta taking the right models. So. I didn't have the experience really going into it to fully tackle a whole design. And um, of course I took Janus's lead from this for, for this the, the basis of his design, but there was a lot of discovery to be done. And um, and it took me nine months to get the crossover right and to really find the working points and to get to grips with everything. Now that seems a lot of effort, but it it it, it there are some things that help you with this and I'll go into it and, and it is you get insights that and experiences that you will not get anywhere else and I think they're very useful in getting a satisfying um, audio system and um, yeah so I want to tell a couple of things about it and, and one of the things in this is that a a speaker is not independent of the amp so that's one thing to realize. You cannot get a speaker, uh, if you have a speaker that is built for a non-feedback amplifier, it is very different than those that are built for a feedback amplifier. They can be very different. It doesn't have to be, but it can be. And so um, when you have, for example, this is built for a tube amplifier with no, no feedback, I, can do the, I have different options available for me to do the crossover, which you see there sitting. Half of the parts there are unused, by the way. It's just uh, because it still has an experimental setup. And I said, I just didn't, don't find the motivation to do anything about it. Um, so very different. Um, and, and that leads me into the, the next point is if you consider DIY and you compare it to um, um, buying something or buying a, a standard design, with buying a standard design, 
what was it designed for? For what amplifier? For what position in the living room? Will your aesthetics commission um, allow you to pull the, the speakers one and a half meter into the room, which is their optimal position maybe? Um, what, what kind of room is it? Is it a co with concrete walls or with wood? Uh, um, how, how large is it? All of those factors will, those design factors with which the designer has built your speaker with, or maybe when you read the review, so all of those things are fake certainties for you. The, the known design, the, the, the known reviewer, the, the, you have no idea what amp they have. You have no idea what room they have. You now have no idea what they like, what their preferences are. You don't know what kind of amp it was designed for. However, when you go the DIY path, you have full control over everything. If you go to silver wiring with interconnects and you get a slight more brightness in your signal, you can adjust it in the crossover. And while you're building with your speaker and you have your amp under control like I have, this is not an issue. In fact, you, you'll be, be getting highly tuned to getting the right thing out of it. Well, if you buy a product with warranty, you don't know what the conditions are and you, you, you will not modify it because it avoids your warranty. So what I want to illustrate here is just between the two camps, there's a huge difference and one might like challenging, the other might look certain, uh, protected by brand by brand and reviews and, and, and knownness of that, of that path. But the other one actually gives you the ultimate security because you have control over the process you can fix it and and with the other one it's a gamble and that's why people end up so uh, swapping so much and um so yeah and the nine months so would i recommend it well if you know ohm's law and and you can go online and you can you know punch in a couple of crossover design uh, parameters into a web calculator i would say and you you know you have a bit of can do spirit I would definitely recommend taking up this project. It doesn't require a highly educated thing. Um, your listening will improve massively. You'll learn a shitload, and I will share about that more in my second video because we're almost done with this one. So I would highly recommend going into this path because you will pick up more facets and you'll have more special experiences that you have never had before um, and that you'll learn and, and your insights will develop and you will actually start to understand what speaker designers say and so on um, uh, to a level that you will, uh, will not otherwise get. So, and I think that's the big opportunity, I, apart from having a very satisfying build and, and, and also, you know, I've, I've left them bare now and it's fine, but it's, um, you could also do, do the design bit on that. Um, Speaking of which, for example, um, having this smaller bevel in this front made it look far less boxy than normally a speaker is. So, um, you know, you get to do things that um, um, other people don't do and, and can really suit, suit the, the room or your design, uh, you know, your design preferences you can actually put into action. Um, and really the woodworking skills is also not that much. If you know how to do a power tool, just take your time and um, it'll turn out fine. And else you just go the prototype route like I did. You learn with that one and you build a better one. So that's it for now. Um, in part two, we'll go into some breakthrough um, sound quality things and some experiences that I had. And um, and then I'll get into some crossover design tips and I'll also look at the crossover design itself. This is it for part one of this uh, video and um, thank you for listening. I hope you got something out of it and um, if you have any questions, post them in the comments and I'll usually get to it within one day or so. And um, yes, that's it until I hope to catch you in the next video and until then have a brilliant day. Bye bye.